and we are live welcome welcome everybody thank you so much for being here with us this evening in our live conversation on the black experience in education first and foremost i'm going to give a disclaimer if you hear a screaming child in the background it is my daughter she's absolutely fine she's refusing to sleep um but yeah just just bear with us as as that is getting sorted at the moment um so my name is Vanessa Morrison for those who don't know me I'm the founder and director of the Blueprint Way which is an online coaching and counseling service specifically serving black and brown women and an important part of the work that I do is around helping my clients fight imposter syndrome through one-to-one -one work, group workshops, as well as my recently published book, Me, Myself and Imposter, How to Boss Your Imposter Syndrome Through the Fraud Framework. And I'm so, so glad um, to be here with my incredible guests, Natasha, Kamiji and Irene this evening, and we'll learn more about them shortly. Um, I'm really, really looking forward to this conversation. So a little bit of housekeeping to start with. We do have a dedicated Q&A section at the end of our conversation, but please feel free um, to submit your questions throughout um, as we might be able to touch on some of the questions that come up um, in earlier points of our conversation. Um, right, so feel free to kind of kick back, relax, get yourself a drink of your choice and settle into what I'm pretty sure is gonna be a very insightful evening. Um, Obviously, also to remind you, this is a live event that is being streamed and recorded. So please be aware of whatever comments you make or questions you ask, as they will be visible in the replay. Um, right, so let's delve into our meaty conversation. First up, I want to introduce the wonderful Natasha Boyce. And um, yeah, we'll go, we'll go right into it. So Natasha, Boyce is a qualified secondary school teacher with over 20 years teaching experience. She has taught in a number of secondary schools across Leicester and her experience also includes teaching in further education and prison. In recent years, much of Natasha's work as an educationalist has been driving discussions around race equity and social justice in education. Natasha has delivered racial literacy training in schools across Leicester and Leicestershire. She also founded one of the first Stephen Lawrence student ambassador groups in the city, thereby training students as leaders in the journey to creating socially just communities. Natasha is also a researcher and is completing a master's degree in black humanities at the University of Bristol and plans to continue academic study further. Wow, fantastic. Natasha, it is so lovely to meet you. It is so, so lovely to meet you, Natasha. Thank you so much for being here with us this evening. It's a um, pleasure to be invited. Thank you. Absolutely. And we're looking forward to hearing more from you as the evening goes on. Okay, next we've got Kamiji Ebun Cole, and I'm just going to read her. Hi, Kamiji. Good to, <laughs> glad to have you here. We'll just read your bio. Thank you. Glad to be here. Absolutely. Right. From educating five to 18 year olds in mainstream private and alternative educational institutions to creating, oh, sorry, to educating managers of managers belonging to her global corporate clientele, whoever the audience, empowering unique individuals to understand their invaluable relevance to all educational spaces, discussions and movements has always been Kamiji's passion and forte. A creative at heart, Kamiji is excited to advocate change in education through contributing in projects such as the BBC documentary Subnormal by L uh, Latanya Shannon, executive produced by Sir Steve McQueen, in order to further the discussion on the black experience of the British education system. With some progress made and still centuries of work to do, Kamiji is open, keen and ready to engage in conversations like today's to contribute um, to the in, sorry, um, my slide is covered. To contribute to the imperative systemic change that black individuals and communities well-being and, in, in and inevitably career prospects depend on. Welcome Kamiji again. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank you, Vanessa. Honored to be here. Really excited to kickstart the combo. Fabulous. And finally, last but definitely not least, we have Irene. Welcome Irene. Thank you so much for being here with us today. And just a little bio on Irene as well. Right, Irene has been working for Eastgate for nine years, organizing conferences, teaching and leading the prayer and prophetic teams. As part of her role, she also builds partnerships with churches and ministries across the UK and Europe. She previously worked as a high school teacher and as a translator. 
She has studied the impacts of the concepts of race in different environments and has been helping churches and Christians examine their biases. She trains and mentors emerging prophets as well as those who want to grow in maturity in the prophetic. She regularly teaches at Eastgate Spiritual School of Life. She also travels to equip and lead ministry teams in churches, events, and Christian festivals. She has a heart for unity and diversity and is passionate about equipping Christians to walk in their destiny with boldness and have a transformational impact on the world around them. Thank you so much again for being here with us, Irene. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited about this conversation. Yay, same here. Um, right, so let's let's dive into it, ladies, because clearly you all, all three of you have so much um, experience when it comes to education um, in different settings as well. And I'm really looking forward to kind of delving deeper into actually education and the black experience in education. Okay, let's move on. Right, we're here to talk about the black experience in education. And the first question for me that comes up is, what is the black experience in education? And why are we talking about it? So firstly, let's introduce some definitions of um, education so that we're all on the same page and kind of know where we're going with this conversation. So I did some Googling and education is defined as um, the process of receiving or giving systematic instruction, especially at a school or university. And that is by the Oxford Dictionary. And the second element is that education is the study of methods and theories of teaching. So this is provided by the Cambridge Dictionary. So in, in all, education really is a structured way of teaching or learning delivered within different institutions. So we've got examples here of schools, of um, churches, community centers, and so on. Um, now let's move on to the black experience in education. And why are we talking about that in particular? The black experience is the general collective of practical and psychological interactions that people of African and Caribbean descent have with the world around them. And these are kind of uniquely influenced by their perceived race and or cultural background. Um, and I wanted to point out that obviously we know that black people are not a monolith. And so the term black experience in itself is pretty much a misnomer. Um, but there are some overlapping experiences black people living in majority white countries experience. Um, and this is based on their race or cultural backgrounds that, um, that have been attributed to them, that they attribute to themselves and that have been attributed to them by others. And so tonight we're focusing specifically on the UK or Europe. And I would love to hear your insights, ladies, with regards to, is there a distinct black experience in education? and that being separate from other experiences? And if yes, why? I know it's a, it's a big question to, to start with. Um, but yeah, any, any thoughts, any ponderings from your side as to, is there a, a distinct black experience in education? Who wants to, who wants to have a go? I see, we seem to have lost um, Natasha, but I'm sure she's gonna come back in shortly. I'll go then. Um... Yes, I would say there definitely is a distinct black experience within the UK and mm -hmm. no one experience will be the same for anyone, um, whether they identify as being black or not, mm -hmm. but straight away my mind goes to educators, black mm -hmm. educators, mm -hmm. and then I think students, because black educators were likely either black students within the education system, the British education system, or mm -hmm. in another education system, not in the UK. And for black educators who have seen education through time, some period of time, through some generations, whether that's because they were in it as a student and then as a teacher, or just because they've taught for many years in the mm -hmm. UK, I think uh, distinct is the definite word because, um, being an ethnic minority within a um, within a system which is definitely um, rooted in systemic systemically oppressive kind of roots, um, mm -hmm. there's just so much that is distinctive about the black experience within education, and mm -hmm. I, I 
you don't know where to start. So I'm really excited to break it all down and become a bit mm -hmm. more specific so that we can dip into the different parts. But I would say as a teacher, um, the word palatability is very important because one, you're wearing a professional hat and two, you're black. And mm -hmm. so both together means that you have to be the best of the black. Mm -hmm. And it's not because you are a education, you're a role model within education. So mm -hmm. you know, students about morals, etc. But it's also because you are black and mm -hmm. you're a role model. Um, next to your white or um, other ethnic um, counterparts, you know, you are there representing. So rep representation is a big thing, which um, I think creates a lot of pressure, but also a lot of opportunity. And so, mm -hmm. yeah, many aspects of, of holding that um, position that really deserves deep conversation. So I'm excited to hear what yeah. everyone else has to say. <laughs> Thank you, Kamiz. You really appreciate that. Yeah. Irene, any, anything you want to add? Oh, I think you're muted. You know, it's been uh, three years since the pandemic and I'm still muted on a call. This is a bit <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, Yeah, I would say that there is distinctly a, a black experience, I think, even though, as you said, uh, blackness is not monolithic monolithic mm -hmm. uh, we all have kind of different experiences but there are yeah. things that are resonating i think for each of us and as an educator as a teacher it just feels like you've got an extra weight when yeah. you're doing it uh two mm -hmm. of the things that jumped at me when you asked the question was the the amount of stereotypes you have to fight mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, even in the way you consider your own students uh, and the, I was very surprised by the amount of uh, interiorized racism that I had to fight uh, mm. in terms of stereotypes and how to view my students uh, who were black and brown. Mm -hmm. uh, but also, as Kamiji was saying, there's that expectation that you have to be more than perfect uh, because yeah. you're usually the only one or there are two or three of you. When I became a teacher, I was the first black teacher that I had ever seen, that I have ever had after yeah. 20 years of education, something like that, wow. apart from my time in America. Um, but my whole time where I was educated in Europe, I had never seen another black teacher. I had wow. never seen a teacher that was non-white. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't even just black. Yeah. I had never seen a teacher that was wow. non-white. And by the time I became a teacher, my students had never had a teacher that was non-white. Mm. So mm. that was kind of still, you know. Um, so yeah, there's that extra level of expectation uh, where, uh, yeah, you can't be mediocre. You have yeah. to be excellent, consistent. Yeah. Wow. Thank you for sharing that, Erin. Wow. I'm looking forward to delving deeper into, as Kamiji was saying, delving deeper into some of the conversations and experiences that you've had. Um, Tasha, we were just asking the question whether we feel like there is a distinct black experience in education. I'm not sure if you want to share anything now or if you want to wait, it's, it's entirely up to you. Um, and if, yeah, if we can say that there's a distinct black experience separate from other experiences. Uh, sorry for dropping out. I don't know. No, don't worry. Computer. So thank you for your patience. Yes, no I do. I do think there is a distinct black experience. And mm -hmm. I think that the black experience is reflective in education as it is of society. So mm. black people within British society are marginalized mm. and positioned as the other. And yeah. also that we, the, the racism we know is built on the ideology that mm. black people are inferior, even though there's no science to genetically justify that. The belief yeah. is still very prevalent and I think that that is evident in the education system in this country. And yeah. that's why I think that, um, as the former speaker said, you wouldn't have you wouldn't have engaged with a black teacher because there was no expectation that we mm. would be in the position of educators, that mm. we wouldn't be um, having those high aspirations. So mm. I think that um, the 
the negative the negative um, views of black children and the low expectations of them to achieve is mm -hmm. reflective one of what the profession looks like but also the fight the extra fight that our children have to have to mm -hmm. gain patients there's actually a theory that that supports that it's called mm -hmm. the pygmalion effect and the mm -hmm. pygmalion effect says that if you're in a classroom where your teacher has high expectations of you then your your uh, behavior to learning is going to be of a high performer well, racism mm -hmm. means that our children are not supposed to, then the, the expectations of them is compliance. It's not about thriving. It's not about growing. It's not about mm -hmm. excelling. And it's definitely not about becoming a professional and obtaining a position of power. So mm -hmm. that defines the black experience, I would say. And anyone who doesn't identify with that is probably an outlier. Because I think mm -hmm. that often, we talk about the black experience and racism tries to make us think of, think of it in a subjective way. But when I've shared stories of my educational experience with my peers mm -hmm. who are black women, there's a common thread. So it has to be systemic. It mm -hmm. can't be in us. It has to be in the system. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Thank you, Natasha, for sharing that. And um, like, yeah. And we're looking forward to kind of just dissecting this more. There's there's so much richness in what all three of you have shared so far. Um, and I, I completely, when I was thinking about, oh, black experience in education, is that a bit controversial? How are people going to react to that and feel about that? But I thought to myself, no, actually, in a world that still struggles with racism, almost every experience we have is racialized. Every Almost every experience we have is going to be impacted by the race that we identify with or we are being made to identify with. Um, and that's just how simple it is. So there will be a black experience because people will perceive us in different ways. Yeah. Okay, let's um, move on to a topic that I'm very passionate about and that is, Imposter syndrome. So looking at black experience in education and impo IS's imposter syndrome. So, you know, as we cover definitions and relevance of black experience in education, I kind of want to tackle that, that uh, intersection with imposter syndrome as well. I'm pretty sure it's going to come up as we're continuing to speak, but um, exploring that intersection between the black experience in education and imposter syndrome, it's really important to understand what imposter syndrome is. And so here's a working definition that I used in my book um, that I want to share with everybody. I'll have a look at this here. So imposter syndrome is a persistent experience of inadequacy, incompetence, and context-specific isolation in which objective successes are discounted or attributed to anything other than personal effort and ability. And I highlighted kind of the key words in there, the, the feelings of inadequacy, incompetence, and isolation. And like I said, I'm pretty sure that some of these things are going to be tackled as we go through um, more of, of our um, presentation today and our conversation today. Um, so one of the thing, excerpts that I wanted to share from the book is with regards to research that was done um, that found that imposter syndrome was a greater indicator of psychological distress in black students attending predominantly white universities than minority status stress. So that is things like racism and discrimination. So that means the psychological well-being of those black students was more negatively impacted by imposter syndrome than by their experiences with racism which I thought when I first read that, I was like, hmm, interesting. But actually, um, we probably also need to look at causality and correlation because another study identified that in interaction of imposter syndrome and minority status stress creates a more distressing psychological burden for black students and that experiencing minority status stress can often trigger feelings of imposterism. So being discriminated against being a victim of racism is going to make you feel more like an imposter because, again, one of those key words within the definition is isolation. So the more our sense of belonging is put into question, the more there's space for imposter syndrome to come up. Um, and the excerpt ends with saying, so not only does imposter syndrome mentally harm students more than racism, for other students, racism itself can make some students feel like they're an imposter. So it's this catch-22, is it the chicken or the egg, which one comes first? But there clearly is a, um, a strong um, correlation and connection between imposter syndrome 
and education uh, and the black experience in education. So that's what I kind of wanted to, to start off with that. And, and now moving over to you ladies to kind of start with your journeys of becoming black educators. Like, are you comfortable with sharing a little bit of your, of your journeys? And in particular, starting off with, you know, your insights into your personal education first. So your experiences with schooling, teachers, um, those kind of things. I know Irene touched on some of that already, um, but if any of you would like to um, start, you know, uh, really, that would be great. Anyone wants to share kind of what, what was your experience growing up? Um, what was your education like and how did you become an educator? I'm happy to share. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, I'm happy to share. So mm -hmm. uh, being educated in Britain under this mm -hmm. education system all the way through, um, I loved learning, come from a, a family that has high aspirations, so was encouraged to have, um, to achieve, but hated school. And I hated teachers. And what I realized on reflection was that the, the gulf between the culture of the teachers and students like me was so far apart. So the teaching profession at that, that time was dominated by white male middle-class teachers. I grew up as a child, a black female on an estate I, the friends that I had were from the same background as me. We automatically walked into an environment that already put us in a box of where our limits would be. And those teachers had the power to frame our educational experience. Crossing over into the classroom myself, I still have to fight and challenge the culture that those leaders still have. Because when we look at the leaders of education in this country, I don't want to sound too controversial, but it is white, male and pale. White, pale and stale, sorry. And it's replicating the values that work for them. Now, when, when I go to work, I, there is an expectation on me to fit into that dominant culture. That means that I have to code switch. And if I show up authentically, I'm made to feel like I don't fit. And that's where I think imposter syndrome comes from. The imposter syndrome is not in you. The imposter syndrome is coming from the environment that is rejecting you, saying that you don't fit because you yeah. don't share the same norms and values. Mm. So I agree with the second statement that says that racism causes imposter syndrome. Mm. It's almost like um, a body rejecting an organ. Mm. And it's, re it's the rejection. Mm. Stuart Hall says that as black people, the sociologist said that when we are, when we are perceived to be out of place, Mm -hmm. There will be forces of resistance trying to put us as black people back into our place. Mm. And that, I think, is the manifestation of imposter syndrome. But the narrative is that the inadequacy is in you rather mm. than the rejection in the system. And it's mm. when you work within that system, you realise, as uh, uh, Irene, Irene? Irene. 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 Ren said, is Ren said earlier that you have to work twice as hard. What it's not that you have to work twice as hard, is that when you really look at it, you observe from the margins of your working practice, you see the incompetence of these people that are given so much grace and support, where you're not given that grace and that support, and mm. that translate to you translate to you having to be excellent. And that's where we really need to be clear that we can occupy spaces authentically because that mm. value. So yeah. that, they're just my reflections. Yeah, thank you for sharing that, Tasha. And so how did you, how did you kind of bridge the gap between, you know, growing up, not seeing yourself reflected in your teachers or education system, hating school, hating teachers, to then becoming an educator yourself? How did that transition happen? 
I think what what happened to me was that I knew that there were students like me and my peers that needed to have a teacher like me. They needed someone that would uh, advocate on their behalf. And that's what drove me to become a teacher. And not only did that drive me to become a teacher, as I matured as a teacher, I realized how important it was for me to show up authentically because then that gave the students the permission to be authentic too. And the problem is, is that we are all conditioned with a white bias. That's colonialism. We're all conditioned with that. So it is about breaking down that mentality and recognizing that you are more than enough and that the way that you show up authentically adds value because the conditioning tells us that we are deficient, incompetent, and all of those things. So it's, it's recognizing that we don't jump through their matrices. As black people, we have our own indicators of success and defining what those are. I love that. I love that. We have our own indicators of success and defining what those are. That's so important. Um, yeah. Wow. Okay. Thank you for sharing that, Tasha. Um, Irene, what are your, what are your, do you want to share a little bit about your journey with education and how you became an educator? Yeah. Um, I can so relate to some aspects of Natasha's story. Um, as we said, we have so many strands that kind of, you know, come from the same story because we're all suffering from the same systemic, uh, uh, racism that tries to put us in a box. Uh, for me, I come from a family of high achievers. My dad had uh, three PhDs by the time I started school and a fourth one by the time I finished school. Uh, so there was an expectation that we were, we were going to be excellent, but it was also drilled into us from a very young age that because of the color of our skin, we will have, like no one will forgive us anything. So you will have to be better than good consistently. So that was kind of what drilled into me from a young age. I've always loved the learning. I still love learning. Um, and I've always been the only one in my classroom, the only black person in my classroom. Like my brother and I we were the only black kids in the schools that we were in because of mm -hmm. where our parents lived. And yeah, that was just like, we were the only black family in the neighborhood. So mm -hmm. and, you know, consistent, that consistent and isolation and um, mm. I remember looking through the questions I was thinking oh I'm not really sure that imposter syndrome uh, translated that much in my education because you know uh, excellence was so high but actually excellence was so high in our system so that we would compensate for what people expected of us so I spent my entire life compensating for what mm. people were expecting of me um, yeah still remember to this day, I did ancient Greek at school just because I love languages and I love the Greek alphabet. So I did ancient Greek in high school. And when mm -hmm. I went to uni, my uh, ancient Greek teacher had never seen a black student ever. Wow. And so she kept asking me questions like, have you been adopted? Is that the reason why? You're so wow. So, can I touch your hair? No, you, you, you really cannot. Um, she had like all those assumptions about me, like how come, how come you're good at languages? I don't. I she, she could not make sense of me. I gave up uh, ancient Greek after that because I couldn't bear being with the same teacher forever. Oh wow! Um, but that was kind of my experience through uni, and culminating to the my kind of. Uh, ignored imposter syndrome culminated in me getting the same degrees twice. So we come again? Yes. I basically studied the same topics in two different universities just because. <laughs> wow. One wow. in France, one in America. Wow. And it's just like, you know, on paper, you're like, oh, yeah, this girl may really like studying, which I really genuinely do. Mm -hmm. But actually, I also needed to prove to myself that I'm actually really good at what I'm going to teach. Mm. I don't know any of my white friends who have had 
the feeling or the need <laughs> to study the same topic twice <laughs> just to justify yeah. things. Um, yeah. So, yeah, but the same as uh, Natasha, I became a teacher because I wanted to not just be the only one. I wanted mm. my students to see someone else who looked like them, who spoke like them. Uh, and it took me a while. It took me about five years to come to a place where where I was a lot more aware of the, inter the internalized uh, uh, racism, even in my um, practice as a teacher. Mm -hmm. And it took me moving to a school that had predominantly black and brown students to actually be able to challenge those understandings and those stereotypes and to create an experience that was a bit more authentic. Uh, mm. so Students could actually relate to me because it's not it's not just about being visible, but mm. you also have to be the bridge so that they can see themselves. Yeah, where you're at now, so that in twenty years' time we can tell that there are more and more and more black teachers, and that it's normalized to be black, mm. or to be black and be a doctor, or to be black and be something else. But like, we have to create. It's it's not enough to be there we also have to create that bridge. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow, thanks for sharing that, Irene. And yeah, man, I have so much to say about, about the imposter syndrome that we might not have realized. Uh, the, there's an imposter type called the expert, which basically consistently looks out for and seeks to grow their academic knowledge and understanding. And it sounds like that was one that you were gifted with by your environment, <laughs> as was I. So I completely understand that. Um, but yeah, OK, Kamiji, um, please let us know how your experiences with kind of your educational experience and then your experience of becoming an educator. What was your journey like? Yeah, so there are things that definitely resonate with me that the mm -hmm. love of Tasha and the amazing Irene have touched on but I grew up um with a mother who encouraged me to dream and to dream big mm. and a father who reminded me constantly that I was always going to have to work harder than everyone else so there was this grounding <laughs> like an anchor that pulled me down mm. and you know this sense of you've got this anything mm. that you desire, anything that your imagination can touch can be tangible in your life. And mm. I need both to create this person that I am today. And mm. I'm so grateful for both of those sides. But when I was younger, I resented the side that my dad showed, took, like gave to me, which was the ground. Because mm. I thought all of these examples that you give me about why I need to be better, why mm. I excellent why i need to be flawless you know these examples are not something i want to normalize mm. and um i just found it very hard to digest that and so i was actually late to the party the party of oh my gosh being black is really really hard mm. because I genuinely i genuinely firstly i i i i naturally have a disposition of joy a joyful mm. I've always had it since I was younger and mm. so naturally that was like my superpower just growing up I was quite joyful and then secondly I had this cheerleader in my life called my mother who would literally you know for her being black and she's never said this to me before she's never articulated this to me but for her being black is so rich and so beautiful mm. that's all I saw when I looked at her and that's what people feel when they're around her and they they describe, oh my goodness, your mom's amazing. I love your mom. How is your mom? Tell me how your mom is. Da, da, da. Because she just holds this um, richness, which isn't mm. to do with wealth. It's to do with knowing who she is. Mm. And so I think I inherited that and ran with that and allowed that to be my fuel that allowed me to push doors open everywhere. Mm. When I was little, I would say, I want to do this and I'd make a way. I want to create this and I'd make a way. And so I just had this journey where um, I ended up doing lots of fun, amazing things, lots of wonderful opportunities. Mm -hmm. um, point where through education, my mum my mom had worked really hard to try and place us in places that we had been rejected from. 
So mm-hmm. it's, you know, your child cannot be in that school because they don't live close enough because we lived in East London and my mum wanted to get us to a school that was out somewhere more rural and they'd say no. And she'd just say a prayer and push through and call and call and call and call whoever she needed to call until she got us in. So I was mm. always surrounded by people who I wasn't meant to be around. Mm. And I that because my mum never made that apparent. Mm. And so I would be in schools where I was the only black person until mm. I remember there was this one day I was with my friends and this, um, this boy said, like he came over to us because we were looking at the school photos and he, um, he went, oh my gosh, look at you. You're the only black person in our year. I went, what? (laughs) And we were already in year, I think nine or something like that. So secondary school, midway through secondary school. And I only just realized, wait a minute, I am. Because Mm. I was me. And I realized that for my friends, I was me, but I was also black. And um, and so, as I say, I was late to the party when it came to understanding what my dad had always explained to me. Mm-hmm. That being black holds a lot of weight, which you don't necessarily want to carry, and you don't necessarily you shouldn't necessarily have to carry, mm. but will carry it. Mm. Boy, oh boy, when I realised when I entered that party, and I realised, was I shocked? Mm. And that's why I would encourage every person who has the opportunity to be a black educator because it was actually during my time of being a black educator when it really hit me my blackness Mm. (laughs) and the way my blackness was going to affect my life not because of blackness should affect your life like that but because of because of systemic racism you know Mm. the injustice of systemic racism, my blackness was going to hurt me at some point, mm. you know, and I, I would encourage every black educator to embrace both sides, that mm. you do not have to answer to people's questions that you, that you have to educate them on, on, mm. on you know, um, on equality, on, on how to be a good ally. You don't have to be that person to show up all the time, but you also remember that you are, you, so basically you can just be yourself. You should be able to walk into a room and just, you know, light up the room with your uniqueness, but also recognize there will be times when you need to educate young black people on what's to come because it's not, um, it's not a sprint, it's a marathon. And that's been my kind of experience towards the latter side of my educating. Mm -hmm. Um, as an educator I, I've done 10, 10 to 11 years now of being mm. an educator moving from secondary school education doing a bit of primary here and there and now educating adults in the corporate world educating mm. companies and um, I now have a healthy balance between the two and I had some really good friends who walked me through my my shocker season when I was trying mm. to with, you know understanding the other more weighty side yeah Thank you for sharing that, Kimiji. And I, I really, it really resonates with me with you saying that, you know what, actually, you were late to join the party because I feel like that was the same for me as well. And I, I was born and raised in Germany, so <laughs> I can't remember. By default as such, um, I was the only black kid in my school, except for my brother, who was a year, who was a year and a half younger than I am. So we were, we were the only black kids in our school, of like hundreds and hundreds of students, you know, but, um, I think, yeah, apart from the, you just have to work hard, you know, but, but being surrounded by parents and family who were black intellectuals, who were, you know, leaders in their own right. And I think there's also something to be said about, and I'm not sure in terms of our different migration or immigration stories, but so I, my parents were first generation immigrants to Germany. So they spent all of the, most of their schooling in Sierra Leone. They were born and raised and grew up among black people, you know, where the judge is black and the police officer is black and the cleaner is black and the lunch lady is black, but like everybody's black, you know, it's a very different experience to then being in Germany when you're like, yeah, we're the only black children. But because of family, we knew what was possible. We knew what was around us. Um, you know, we, uh, we had in our family doctors and judges and ambassadors. And so there was never kind of a question of imposter syndrome, funnily enough. At that at the time growing up 
but I, I do I do know that for, I think my experience came in my A level years um, when I started to to realize that oh um, there seems to be a distinction between myself and my peers in terms of what we were achieving even though you know we would subject uh, subjectively look at each other's homework and be like this is this is the same caliber this is the same quality why is Benetta getting C's and everybody is getting A's um, and it was one particular my German teacher actually in in, in my A levels that 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 pattern kept com consistently repeating itself and it was just like we don't understand and then I ended up taking German as an A level subject and it's externally marked and anonymously marked and suddenly that C went to an A star and I was like oh oh great because I always knew that I because for me it was an annoying it's like an annoying fly that you're just like something isn't right here this needs to be corrected but I just it just made me reflect on the fact that what if I was in a position where I was questioning my identity and questioning my ability to be like oh maybe this is who I am is it maybe this is what I'm producing rather than recognizing something wasn't right in that environment for, for me to consistently have lower grades because this teacher knew who I was. And as soon as anonymity was introduced, I was on par with everybody else as I should have been the whole time. Um, so yeah, I really appreciate you sharing your experience, Kamiji, with regards to late to the party and like, what, what was it like, you know, growing up without necessarily that sense, at least to begin with of limitation um, but what then happens when you enter the world, the real world, and see that, oh, this is not how everybody's experience really is. Um, yeah, thank you for sharing that. So, ladies, I really would love to find out, um, especially because I feel like all of you have transitioned out of being educators within schools. Um, how, how, how has that transition been and what does what does it now mean being an educator for you um now versus the beginning of your journey and uh Irene, i'm happy for you to to start with that if you want to yeah um it's an interesting one i think for me i needed a break mm. it was as simple as that i just needed mm -hmm. a break um the 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 education system is thoroughly unjust mm. and um, I think mm. there's beauty about being an educator, there's something absolutely fantastic about transmitting knowledge to a child. Um, I love the classroom experience, I absolutely love being a teacher, uh, mm. I loved being a teacher for the whole like you know 10-12 years of my career uh, as a, a high school teacher, absolutely loved it. But at the same time, um, the level of expectation that is put on a child that is non-white i would say um or yeah the level of expectations is there's so much that is stacked against the child by the time he reaches school that for me i felt at some point i felt like i was more of a, um, an accomplice to a bad system than an ally to uh, um, something that would bring justice to the system and it was it just became too much for me to bear um mm -hmm. i feel like particularly in the past five years i tried a lot to kind of open um the minds of my students like you know try to fight the limitations but at the end of the day we're not just fighting a school system we're fighting like a whole system um and i just needed a break so I took a break um, and I thought that my break would just last a year and, you know, 10 years later, uh, here I am. Uh, I would say, though, that I came back into teaching by teaching adults now mm -hmm. and um, and in a Christian environment instead of a non-Christian environment, mm -hmm. which he has been a very different experience, but mm -hmm. also this is, you know, uh, yeah, there are similarities still, and mm -hmm. uh, the, the um, concept of race is everywhere. Whether mm. you want to it or not, it is everywhere, and it's pervasive everywhere. So I find myself kind of fighting the same fight, but in a different way, with a mm -hmm. more maturity, 
um, mm -hmm. and a different way. And I believe that I believe that I will come back into like mainstream education for children education at some point, mm -hmm. maybe in, in another role, but at some point. But I will have gained a lot of experience mm -hmm. um, in doing other things. So that for me was the way of like just I needed a break, so I took a break. Yeah. But actually, I didn't stop paying attention. I didn't stop learning, and I didn't stop educating. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that, Irene. And kind of on the back of that, um, Kamiji, I want to ask, what would you say was the biggest adjustment for you in your journey um, towards education? Um, uh, oh, sorry, go on. Yes. Yeah, no, yeah. In your journey towards education, what would you say was the biggest adjustment for you from the start and then now as you're educating adults as well and, and com corporate clients? Ah, I actually thought you meant what was the adjustment the biggest adjustment going from educating in mainstream education to educating adults. Feel free if you want. If you want it, yeah. That that's a that's a, well, a did, great place to start. It, it did tickle me when you said that because I automatically remembered a conversation I had with someone in this virtual room, actually, <laughs> and it was actually Iren mm. because I was in one of my first corporate roles, um, educating like a big client and. I was pacing myself and getting used to it and la la la, la really enjoying it. And mm -hmm. I remember having a conversation with Irene and Irene saying, because I was like, oh, you know, just trying to get to grips with like the way, the pedagogy of the, the um, you know, of the corporate world. Mm -hmm. And then um, kind of just, I'm quite hard on myself sometimes. And I really wanted to be like on it, on it, on it, on it, on it. And Irene was like, please do remember that teachers are like, sorry, I'm paraphrasing. I'm sure you said it better than this and please correct me if I'm wrong, but like big students in the most respectful way. Mm -hmm. And I had been asking for permission subconsciously, you know, asking for permission with everything I was doing in the corporate world. Whereas everyone was asking me what I wanted. They were like, so tell us how you work. Like, how do you, be how, how, how would you like things to be formatted? Like, you know, what works for you? What times work for you? How do you like to run your meetings? La, 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 la. And I wasn't used to that. And literally mm. I was like, remember, teachers are used to being like big students. You are the best role model student. That's why you mm. use your education and then you just become graduate and become this teacher. Mm. And you're showing them how to be the best student because you are the best student. You were that student. Mm. Right at, you know, pleasing and da, 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 da. And so the transition really was being, <laughs> it was, realizing firstly that I had been institutionalized because mm -hmm. yeah. that's what to our students we make sure mm -hmm. that they understand the rules we make sure they understand the systems we make sure they understand the way the culture works and there is an institutionalization of everyone with every mm -hmm. organization that you go to but education is a very unique space with very mm -hmm. unique customs mm -hmm. and everything from from you know school home to school home or like school building to school building there are different customs but there's this unsaid thing that you are even as a teacher still like a student and mm. that we yeah so it was I guess the biggest adjustment for me was just the liberation to go wow I can take ownership over my professional journey mm. I can take ownership over my character whilst I'm in this space mm -hmm. I can be myself more and mm -hmm. um, also I can also be an adult <laughs> and I can I can I can I can do adult things without mm -hmm. censoring myself because there are many children around and um, but I also think there's a beauty in that freedom because I've, I've come into education in and out since leaving education as a as a full-time teacher and every now and again I've done some because I'm a consultant so in between consultancy sometimes I've done some supply and um, also I've trained schools as well mm -hmm. uh, with regards to well-being through my company and with regards to diversity equity and inclusion as well and mm -hmm. coming in taking off that teacher hat has been so amazing because the children just soak it up mm -hmm. they really relate to you in a way that feels like the engagement that they have with you is unbreakable mm. because they're mesmerized by a person 
Mm. And by a person's passion for what they're talking about and a person's excellence and expertise mm. in that area. And so they're compelled, just like when they watch an amazing film and mm. the actor is completely convincing, just like when they, you know, go to an activity that is led by someone who is not a teacher. You know, it is very much that I think the biggest change for me has been taking off that weighty cloth that says, I have to act in this teachery way, which is amazing, mm. but incredible. But boy, do they need a break from mm. the expectation to be mm. the best student. Yeah. All year yeah. round. Yeah. Well, wow. thank you. Thank you for sharing that, Kanija. And that kind of beautifully links into the next question that I had for, for you, Tasha. And that was with regards to, you know, both Kamiji and Iren mentioned needing a break and, and um, whether personally or teachers in general needing a break. And I guess, Tasha, my question to you is, from your perspective, what does self-care look like um, for you as a Black educator? How, how can you bring that in? And what, what role does it play for you? I'm not sure if you can hear me, Tasha. Why is it frozen? Oh no, she froze. Yes. She's frozen. Okay. Um, okay, let's um while whilst we're waiting for her to refresh, let's let's go back to Iren. You mentioned you needed a break. So what does self-care, what did self-care look like for you in that context? Um I think for me it was a pro it was putting myself first. Um mm. and then forgetting that uh you have to be a role model you have to be perfect you have to be this mm. you have to be that like it was I, I actually i have to be me i owe it mm. to myself i just have to be me so this mm -hmm. is what i'm gonna work on um mm -hmm. and that was my first thing uh giving myself permission to not care was another one mm. um i know it may sound terribly controversial because uh because there's so much <laughs> and uh, and I have studied mm -hmm. the uh, mechanisms and the concepts of race and how they uh, um, you know transpire in different aspects of society for most of my life so I am aware that there's a lot but actually giving myself permission to not know not not carry through things so deeply and just be and explore something that had nothing to do with uh, uh, you know, being black or being a role model or something, um, mm -hmm. it, it always catches you back because at the end of the day, you know, <laughs> you can't escape your blackness yeah. and you just have to embrace it uh, mm -hmm. in different ways. But I think for me, it was just the opportunity of embracing it in a different way. Yeah. And, and not, um, and just leave the struggle um, on on the side for a little while. So mm -hmm. that, that was my myself giving me permission. And then uh, I went into like very practically activities of self care that I think in my mind um, had been reserved to what white people do. Mm -hmm. Go on. And, well, let's say more. So uh, stuff like going to a spa. Mm. A day because actually why not mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um i've always loved ballet so i've always been to the ballet and the theater but making it like a, a more of a routine so this is something that i do every month because actually it brings me joy and it's okay that I'm the only black person in in the audience i don't care mm. like i've given myself permission to do those things like doing silly things like calligraphy um mm -hmm. because you know when i tell my mom she's just like so you are actually paying someone to teach you how to write like mm. cool. <laughs> yes i do because actually i'm cultivating my creative side yeah um and i was very fortunate that i had a mo mother that was very creative and that believed in the arts in general apart from mm. calligraphy but in the arts in general, she was really uh, uh, all about it. So it was just kind of reconnecting with those things. Like I'm going to do stuff just for the sake of doing it and not for okay. the sake of being excellent at it. I'm doing watercolor and I'm really bad at it and it's okay. I'm doing mm -hmm. it for fun. So I had to relearn to do things for mm -hmm. fun rather yeah. than for excellence or, mm -hmm. for, or because it's going to be 
an interesting topic of education later. So yeah. I relearned to do things just for me. Wow, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. That is powerful. Um, yeah, Natasha, I was um, I was going to ask, is there anything that you maybe want to add as to what self-care looks like for you as a black educator? Um, in terms of self-care, I'm referring it back to working in the education environment, in the mainstream mm -hmm. school setting. Mm -hmm. There's an acceptance, we've all accepted that racism is a reality. Mm -hmm. We've all accepted that racism has a weathering effect on black teachers and mm. black students. And Irene epitomized that by saying she needed to take a break. And that mm. led for you to leaving the classroom. And also Kimiji saying that there was a space for reinvention and necessity mm. for that. But what that says to me is that that's a loss for the profession. Mm. Far too common because not only do black children need to see black teachers so that mm. they can be what they can see mm. and someone who can advocate for them at the table and bring that cultural awareness and sensitivity. But all children need to see that there is credibility in diverse thinking and they might think differently and that's okay. So for me to navigate the mainstream classroom environment, what was critical was harnessing networking, really building strong relationships with other black colleagues. So I remember I used to work in Nottingham. While I was working in Nottingham, I built a really strong friendship with another colleague, Marguerite. And her classroom, if my classroom or the school environment ever got too stressful, I could sit in her classroom and it would be a safe space. Mm. And she wasn't gaslighting my reality because what will happen to you is that because your reality is not everybody else's reality who's from the predominant culture, it, the message will be that the issue is with you because there's no commitment to systemic change. Mm. So you need to find people that will affirm your experience and build you up. Mm. And going. Because mm -hmm. we don't want to have a profession that doesn't serve our children. Mm -hmm. you know, I'm sure that you want your daughter to be in an environment where she doesn't have to explain everything or she doesn't have to justify her existence. Yeah. Well, that can come with a diverse workforce. And it's mm -hmm. so important that we do have black teachers in the mainstream classroom. So mm -hmm. I would network with professionals that mm -hmm. confirm what's going on and can give you strategies to keep going. Mm -hmm. And also stop buying into this black excellence nonsense. <laughs> it's, it's, it's not necessary. You mm -hmm. are excellent. The yeah. is turning up. Maya Angelou says that you are enough Mm -hmm. You need to give yourself space mm. to grow. They're getting space to grow and they make mistakes. Mm. You deserve that same level of grace too. And if it's not yeah. being given to you, then you claim it as your mm. entitlement and shake off this black excellent nonsense mm. because you're already excellent and you don't need to prove it. So I yeah. think when we've heard, listened to what's been said tonight, there has been a lot of pressure that we've mm. brought into. And if we just cancelled that out, we would mm. feel so much better, wouldn't yeah. we? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that, Tasha. And and it kind of touches on the question I was going to ask next, and I was going to ask you next, actually, with regards to, you know, is there any advice that you have for Black educators who feel close to burnout in their roles? So you've mentioned that, you know, do the networking, connect, create those safe spaces for yourself, lower that standard or, or, or not lower Just the standard. Just take but that weight off. Exactly. exactly. It's, it's yeah. like the imposter syndrome. You are not the imposter. The mm -hmm. problem is, is that the environment mm -hmm. is not rigged to accept you and mm -hmm. make you feel like an imposter. The same mm -hmm. way you do not need to work twice as hard. Mm -hmm. You need to show up and you need to grow just like everybody else is growing. And mm -hmm. that involves making mistakes mm -hmm. because we are human beings. We are not mm -hmm. human doings. 
So mm. you need to be able to grow and give yourself the grace to grow. Yeah. Okay. So what would you say, um, and I mean, comedian Iren, you can jump in as well. For, to someone who's maybe just started their teaching journey, um, you know, has just come out of, out of schooling and hasn't necessarily had the opportunity or the, the confidence and the courage to be like, actually, I'm going to reject what? I'm going to reject the, the weights and the expectations that are being placed on me. What is, what is, in what way do we engage with those educators? They need an advocate. They mm. need to find someone because everyone has a mentor. Mm. The right guy that is teaching will have someone that he plays football with or mm. cricket or golf with who is mentoring mm -hmm. him in an informal capacity. Yes. Mm -hmm. The same way that newly qualified black teachers need to find someone more experienced that can mentor them. That is crucial mm. for their development. But well, just a word of caution. Franz Fanon says, all skin folk are not kin folk. <laughs> you, need to, you need to be discerning. Mm. You need to be discerning. And you need to, you need to align yourself with someone who is mm. authentic and not assimilated. Because mm. if you are aligning yourself with someone who is assimilated and doesn't feel confident to show up in their full self, then that is going to put limitations on your mm. journey. Yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Tasha. Um, Irena, Kamidi, do you want to add anything to that? Any any advice that you have for black black educators who feel close to burnout? I would say um, give yourself permission to uh, make mistakes mm. because actually everybody else has. So mm -hmm. it's, it's okay to, to give yourself permission to make mistakes. Um, the other thing that I would say is definitely I agree with Natasha about finding mentors, but you don't have to find mentors in your own school or in your own school system. There mm. are black educators that are ready to mentor you in the weirdest possible ways um, uh, or weirdest possible places and just become friends with those, like, you know, em emulate those or uh, get, in, get in connection. We have social media now, which, you know, makes life a lot different. Um, mm. A lot of the role models or the mentors that I have met, for example, for me, were in church. Um, mm -hmm. a, a lot of people that we shouldn't emulate as well. But the, some of the, the strongest relationships that I have or that I have, have been really helpful in my career as an educator have, I have met in environments that you wouldn't necessarily expect to. So keep your eyes open to where you mm. can find the right people and just be ready to be inspired. Thank you. Thank you, Ren. Anything, uh, Miji, that you yeah. want to add? My heart really goes out to uh, the teacher in the day to day. So like when you said, oh, would you be able to give any advice to a teacher, a new teacher? I just say this for any teacher in their day to day who feels like they are on the verge of burnout or is just aware that, you know, the way they're feeling is linked to maybe racism and <laughs> death by a thousand cuts. You know, mm. I would say two things. Number one, and this may sound like a little bit defeatist, but no pick your battles. Mm. Your battles is something I had to learn the hard way, but I've become stronger, a better educator, and a better me for it. Mm. Not, not every battle is your battle. Mm. And only you can decide that. And you don't have to broadcast what is your battle and what's not. Just know yourself, know where you're at, take care of yourself internally, and go mm. into your environment ready with your own microculture. Mm. And you around like that thermostat who decides what you're going to feel today mm. because otherwise you could genuinely if you're an empath like me as well which which a lot of teachers are because they feel what the kids feel and they want to help la, 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 mm -hmm. go in knowing what am I holding today what is my culture what, mm. what what am I from point a home to point b school back to point a what is it that I'm holding and what am what what capacity, to, what capacity do I have to overflow? Mm. What capacity, capacity do I have today to give and gift? Mm. And if not, I won't volunteer for that extra lunchtime duty. Mm. In fact, I'll set the boundary straight and say, 
not in my contract, so not today, mm. unfortunately. Mm. And you're actually allowed to say that, it's fine. There's a lack mm. of boundaries in education because everything's around children and all of a sudden we think we're mothers and fathers to every child. Mm. Mm. We are there to safeguard, bless them in the capacity that we have, but also it's just, it's a profession. It is a profession. Mm. So recognize their boundaries. So number one, it's pick your battles, go in mm. knowing what you can and cannot do today. Mm. And then secondly, sense the season. Mm. Guess what? Your body is intelligent. Mm. And when you feel like a sense of, oh, I, I just feel so, so done with this. It might be that you're done with extracurricular activities and you need to go in schedule a meeting about the fact that your role in this school is slightly changing it mm. might be you need that well-earned break mm. that it really needed that mm. i needed that lots of other teachers need mm. and it might just be because there's a new season on the horizon and you as an educator are not defined whether you're an educator or not is not defined by the teacher role that you have mm -hmm. it comes forms and it's a gift that you had before you got your teaching qualification and it's a gift mm -hmm. you'll have after you leave your teaching job if you do mm -hmm. so yeah sense the season and take time to discern like where is my value needed but also where am i willing to invest my value because you are a gift okay so yeah that's that's pretty much what i would say wow Wow, wow, wow. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. That's some, oh, oh, yeah, these are some really, really great answers. And I hope those that are listening or listening to the replay that our educators are encouraged by this because I do appreciate it is a, it can be a very rough um, experience. And, you know, I applaud every single one of you for the work that you do and have been doing and continue to do in all the spaces that you're in. Um, but we're going to shift. Go, go ahead. Can I just add one tiny thing? I yeah, think, sure. Uh, just in terms of perspective, the first few years of teaching are hard for everybody. Mm. Like they're just, it's just like you're swimming in information, you're swimming in uh, like expectations and everything. And obviously, if you add to that the imposter syndrome that we may have, if you add to that the racial experience that we have, like it's a lot. So, mm. I would, for me, every time I had a coach, like new teachers, uh, it was just that important reminder of like, it's not just you who's drowning. We've all drowned for the first three years of our career, but we're mm. still here. So mm. hang in there is basically what I'm trying to say. Just hang in there mm. um, and, and, and then assess. Uh, definitely keep the boundaries. Definitely we want to go with all the advice that has mm. been given because it's absolutely vital. Uh, mm. Remember that you're uh, being before you, whatever you do, but also remember that it's hard for everybody at the beginning. But mm -hmm. it doesn't have to remain hard though. So that's where yeah. Yeah, I appreciate that. So so that, yeah, like you're saying, discerning, sensing the season, all these kind of things are really important to, to recognize. But I guess part of sensing the season is to realize, hold on, the beginning is hard for everybody. Um, but hold on, if you're 10 years in and it still just feels like this is not working, there maybe should be a conversation with somebody very quickly. Um, okay, moving on from becoming Black educators to... Um, what I would now say is kind of looking at teaching black curriculum. And as you can see, I've put that in kind of speech bubbles and we'll we'll talk about that. Um because I've been intentionally I've been a little bit tongue in cheek um talking about um teaching black curriculum. Um what I really mean is uh, a decolonized curriculum. Um, you know, and again, before we tackle your experiences with either teaching decolonized curriculums um if you've got any or or experiencing it being taught to you um i want to kind of go back to trusted definitions um because i think it's always important that people understand um what we're talking about and where we're at so i was doing a little bit of research and looking into actually what does it mean to decolonize a curriculum um, and there's a couple of definitions that I came across that I hope was, will, would help. So decolonizing curriculum is about being prepared to reconnect, reorder, and reclaim knowledges and teaching methodologies that have been submerged, hidden, or marginalized. 
And this is actually a definition that came by from Times Higher Education. And then we've also got um, decolonizing the curriculum is the process in which we rethink, reframe, and reconstruct the curricula and research that preserve the Europe-centered colonial lens, challenging the institutional hierarchy and monopoly on knowledge moving out of a Western framework. And this is um, by a lady called Sophia Akil, who is um, um, a researcher and also very prominent in decolonizing curriculum. And then I had a final definition. I was going to finish it those, but then I found one from Manchester Met, which I thought was quite useful as well. Um, and it talks about decolonizing the curriculum is about identifying, acknowledging, and challenging the ways in which colonialism has impacted upon perceived knowledge and learning. It is not about deleting existing knowledge or history, but about embracing knowledge systems outside of typical Western understanding and which have hitherto been ignored. Decolonizing is integral to an inclusive curriculum and seeks to both recognize and address the legacies of disadvantage, injustice and racism that have arisen from historic global domination by the West and the consequent inherent whiteness of our STEM disciplines. So that's Manchester Metropolitan University's uh, definition, which I thought, again, was quite insightful. So anything you want to add um, from your end as uh, to so a definition or, or just maybe touch on why do we feel like a decolonized curriculum is important? Yeah, I just want to say one thing, I guess, like, yeah, sure. Um, one of the reasons why it's important, because I know that this is actually something that a lot of people who I have had the pleasure and honour of working alongside, some amazing educators, some wonderful people, um, something that they've found really hard to understand, like, why should we fix what isn't broke, you know, mm. and um, that is one of the most difficult things to here because it really shows the level of education that's needed mm. in order to even be able to make a start and a mm. lot of schools have done the work a lot of leaders have stopped not done the work but acknowledged that there's work to be done and mm -hmm. others have acknowledged that they just don't know what to do but something needs to be done so there has mm -hmm. been there have been shifts there have been changes but you know, you have, I think, just some educating on the cycle of systemic oppression would be amazing, amazing place to start so that people actually understand why a change is necessary. Mm -hmm. because, um, when it comes to systemic oppression, there's like four sections, which I think are really evident in our education system. It's first the internalized and individual. So it's just like, starts with one person, and mm. then it's personal and, mm -hmm. you know, the discrimination that happens interpersonally and then it becomes institutional and then it becomes structural. And so we're mm. fighting structural racism that won't go away through our well-intended but really redundant methods. So mm. the first thing people ask me when they say, oh, you know, oh, you do this, you do, you know, EDI in schools and stuff like that, you know, equity, diversity and inclusion. Could you come and do something? What would you suggest? And they, I say, well, what have you done so far? Because undoubtedly, you've, you've already started some good work. So I would only want to add value, not disturb. You mm -hmm. know, and the first thing they say often is an assembly on racism. Mm -hmm. Literally, I, I feel like that's the worst thing you could do. Mm. Where there's ignorance, a pool of ignorance, and that's normal, and where that's the norm, that's the temperature, the climate of the school, mm. the best intentions and the best hearts, that is like the place where there's the least accountability mm. and where people who already don't feel like, so, you know, the marginalised um, ethnic groups, you know, that's the place where it's the least safe space. There's no accountability. Mm. There's no room for understanding. There's no room for journey. Um, and so, yeah, I think there's just a sense that even before, you know, we can go anywhere, it's just understanding that there actually is a problem. Yeah. And not just it's not the black educators or the black students who need that education. It's not them who need cheerleading and woohoo, we're going to do the Black History Month thing again this year. And, you know, it's, do we all have an understanding? Are we all agreed? 
something needs to change and if not we need to educate you on why something needs to change mm. it's nothing to do with just you because mm. just you have made this big problem mm. okay? so it's not a finger pointing thing it's a this is a structural thing it's, mm. it's a long time but we need to sit down and if we're actually going to do something it needs to be more than a black history month or more than you know nominating the black boy for house captain you know mm face on the website you know representation mm. is always you know yeah so that's that's kind of something I wanted to just touch on yeah thank you for sharing that Kamiji um I guess adding to that to that question is is another one with regards to what is the what would you say is the impact of a decolonized curriculum and um Tasha or, or Irene if anyone wants to take that I'm happy to take that yeah. Um, yeah. Earlier on, I said that we are all um, conditioned with the white bias. Mm -hmm. So I know for myself, and just listening to the experiences of um, my colleagues here, that as a black student, I'm sitting in a school that is telling, I'm reading books written by white authors. They're mm -hmm. telling me in religious studies that God is white, he's, you know, looks mm. like Santa Claus without the red suit, mm. Jesus is white and angels are white and Eve is white and mm. uh, they're telling me that all the inventors are white and mm. um, all the sociologists and the psychologists and the scientists and the historians and the theorists, everyone with knowledge and power mm. is white. Yeah. On top of that, I haven't got a black teacher. I don't mm. see anyone in that environment that seems to have a position of power. Mm. So what is that actually telling me then as a black black person, as a black young mm. person? What's that telling me about my positionality in society? If mm. I'm not seeing anyone in, in embodied in my environment in close mm -hmm. proximity with power, and I'm not hearing that on the curriculum. Mm. So that then says that there is a need mm -hmm. for the curriculum to reflect the, the communities and the young mm. people, the societies that we live in. And decolonizing mm -hmm. the curriculum is not just about um, talking about a, a, an icon or just studying a certain unit. unit. It's, about, it's not about representation. It's about credibility because racism is about power. So mm. it's about saying that Cornell West and W.E. Du Bois is just as um, credible as a voice as any other sociologist. Mm. It's about saying that Sonia Boyce, who is one of the most accomplished artists that the UK has ever produced, is just as credible as a white artist. It's about the credibility that we give to these voices. So some schools see it as just representation, but it's mm. not representation alone. It's about credibility. And mm. we can look at the intersections of that with being black women, that often the, the black women's voices are extremely absent. You know, it's not until I've gone to university and learning about the black humanities that I'm being exposed to these people. I've never heard of them. And I'm nearly 50. That's mm. that's really that's awful to mm. consider that that's the curriculum. But the purpose of the curriculum is to uphold systemic racism. Because mm. why, why would it be so as uh, in your your definition, Eurocentered why would it be so Eurocentered if it didn't have a purpose of conditioning and conditioning our minds and our children's minds to uphold the legacies of colonialism? That's mm. now, and that's why it needs to be dismantled in terms mm. of the power that is being held in the curriculum. Mm. Wow, wow, the power that is being held in the curriculum. And I think so many of us, don't we don't um, approach education in that way to understand the power dynamics, to understand the transfer of power that is implicitly happening 
um, as we are being educated on a on a daily basis. And oh man, like for me again, as a as a mom, and I was I was very candid with all three of you ladies before tonight, saying that you know what, there is so much wisdom between the three of you. There's so much experience that you three have, and I kind of just want to sit down and glean and hear like what some of your experiences and, and from some of your wisdom, because I'm now raising a, a black child in this world. And, you know, to think about the fact that actually the system that I am exposing her to, the same system I was raised in, you know, my parents in a different way, but still I'm pretty sure they didn't hear about Cornell West and W.E.B. Du Bois whilst they, were, <laughs> whilst they were being educated, but they probably would have had some African um, some African icons and legends within their within their curriculum, um, but yeah, that is literally it's it's a power thing. It's who who is credible and who has power. Wow, wow, wow. Uh, Irene, anything you want to share? Add? Um, I was just looking through one of my um, uh, journals and. Uh, uh, saw a memory so on the 16th of October 2021 so in the 21st uh, century I learned that there was actually a black composer in the 18th century so someone who was not just black but actually extremely gifted he was um, actually he could have led the um, opera in Paris and the reason why he wasn't leading it or even though so he was the most competent person to lead it he was a virtuoso but uh, the system was just like oh no we really can't have a black person giving uh, you know leading something as big as the opera I was I, I was furious when I realized that I did my entire education in France I did music education I did theater studies I did all those things where you're supposed to learn those things and I found out in 2021 in the UK that is wow. not okay wow that is absolutely not okay and there's so much that you just realize that um I was reading somewhere we know about the Greek mythology better than we know about the African mythologies oh, why yes. why mm. why aren't our mythologies as valid they have mm. shaped the world in the same way they have shaped mm. the world we come from mm. and mm. so we need to put them back in and I think there's something about um just just as you were saying credibility just putting those things on the same level like mm. if it's mythology why would it have to be like um uh, an African legend it's also a mythology let's mm. let's see them as systems who have built cultures and then who have established like you know longevity and everything and all those little things i think it's just reclaiming those things reclaiming poetry reclaim reclaiming art um mm. yes, i want to look at monet artwork but i also want to look at um other artists that the name escapes me right now because um i can't think of any but like you know i want to look with the same eye that i have for a monet to an african artist or yeah. um, or a black artist, or an Indian one, or mm. you know, a Southeast Asian one. Like I, I want all those things to be kind of served on the plate in the same, mm. at the same time, and not mm. have okay, this is like a secondary exhibition that we're doing. No, and mm -hmm. I, this is a common work that we all need to do, but it's not just the black people who have to do that. Mm -hmm. It's the responsibility that we have to do. Are we ready to actually dismantle the system or mm -hmm. are we just happy for the system to be what it is? Mm -hmm. And I love what you said. There's, there's two things that I wanted to touch on. One is I love what you said about things being served on a plate to us, you know, because some people, you know, might be like, well, if you wanted to know about um, the black composer or, you know, Tasha, you wanted to know about um, what you you were learning at, at almost 50. You could have done that when you were younger. You just uh, chose not to. But, this, that, but the issue is that most people do not have to seek out their learning mm -hmm. because it is mainstream. And again, that is where that whole power comes back in, where it's like, yes, it's what, what has been deemed as credible and um, the standard for everyone to have to know mm -hmm. is what is being served on a platter and all you have to do is attend school 
Mm-hmm. Whereas if we want to learn about, you know, people within our communities that are credible, we have to go and pursue specialist education. And in the mainstream, it's still seen as something other and enigma, mm-hmm. something on the margins. Yeah. It's still not given the same credibility. Mm-hmm. And that's the problem. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And in the day to day, what that would look like. So a teacher watching going, yeah, but where's the time? Practically, where do you want me to do that? When already I'm overworked, underpaid, mm-hmm. and really tired. What that would look like is head of department in each department going, oh, 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 we had that inset day where they said we need to like, you know, or, you know, last summer they said, oh, we need to, you know, diversify the curriculum. We had that incident happen, racism, then that parent complained, then we had this. Right. What are we going to do? I've got my meeting coming up. I've got so much to do and a life to live and health to keep up. What am I going to do with my department when it comes to the meeting after school on Wednesday? I know. I'll Amazon a book quickly. We'll add this in. We've only got six weeks per term. So the scheme of work, if I'm going to, I'm not going to change the whole scheme of work now. No, we've been doing it for three years. If it ain't broke, don't fix it because I'm tired. Mm. So I'm going to slot this in, take out this one lesson. We'll squeeze that learning into one because we still have to do that. And then we'll just add that in. And Nancy's spider, or what, what should we do? What should we do? Let's just grab a book from somewhere and mm. stick it in there. I once walked into a drama lesson after conversations had been had on the fly, just very quickly in, in announcements in um, a, a staff meeting at one school about, you know, racism, blah, 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 we need to change the curriculum. A head of department, I walked into their lesson, a drama lesson, doing animal noises, oh, running around the room, complete racism on show and that's the problem it's like but what does this look like and are people equipped to do this because it can't just yeah. be the black people but then are the black people the only ones who do it because they can only do it well i think that this goes back to teaching um your, when you're doing your nqt here when you're doing your teaching um t- teacher training what is required of teachers because actually, I do not remember any training on diversity, equity, and inclusion. But thankfully, I know a teacher who's being trained right now, and they have just had a day of workshops, which they thought were insightful. So maybe that's a start. Mm. But you know, it, it's there mm. as well. And then I want to challenge Ofsted. These teaching mm. standards. Mm. But who, are, who who is Ofsted? Who who what does Ofsted look what does Ofsted look like? Hmm. They look like fear. Someone mm-hmm. walking down the corridor all of a sudden. No, they're, but, coming, they're coming. No, but what do they look like? Because if we're saying that the te- teaching, uh, the teaching profession is white dominated, and teaching the leadership is even, I think it's two point three percent of head teachers in this country are black. Yeah. Oof. Right. I have all on LinkedIn. And and head teachers tend to make up, and senior leaders tend to make up Ofsted inspectors, and then they're mm-hmm. taking on a certain pool. So what do Ofsted inspectors look like? Mm-hmm. And, and how are they conditioned? And what are they seeing as important? Mm-hmm. What are they looking for? So that's mm-hmm. why you have to consider the whole framework of the mm-hmm. system that we're working within. Mm. Mm. So one more thing, Um, these leaders have been doing their jobs for so long and sometimes are so far removed from so many people that even that job application that you think would come through for that, it's not coming down to you. So Mm. a lot of the time when when people's hearts genuinely want to change, because people do have aha moments, people do have moments Mm. where they think, this isn't right. And there are allies. There are people who genuinely would love to make a change. Don't know what to what capacity. Don't know if they realise what capacity change is needed in. But there are mm. people at the top or who, you know, are of the majority, who are maybe white males who do want to make a change. And working in the corporate industry, you meet so many leaders who genuinely want to make a change but don't actually know how to or mm. 
don't know where to start or are scared to. And there's a mm. lot of hesitation. I won't say anything just in case I say something wrong. Mm. And it's, you know, what is being done on a leadership level? Mm. Where is the support for leaders in terms of, and I know there is a lot out there and people need to do the work themselves, but how can, how can, leaders be tackled because the conversation always ends up with the teachers and mm. actually when and where and how do they make that change in that scheme of work when they are the minority that pressure mm. is crippling it needs mm. to be leaders i i think i don't know if you've been exposed to jane elliott where she's where she does the blue-eyed um the blue-eyed brown-eyed experience with children in america mm -hmm. to explain mm -hmm the nature and function of racism mm -hmm. yeah and what Jane Elliott argues is that white people just need to accept that they're racist because they are conditioned in a racist environment that benefits them yes mm -hmm. now what what Jane Elliott also does is she presents an argument that says that based on the color of someone's skin, they are seen as less human. And mm. she challenges white people to say, would you want to be treated and experience life like a mm. black person? Mm. If the answer is no, what are you gonna do to change it then? Mm. You don't need to read any books. Mm. You don't need to be educated. You don't need any support. If you know that you wouldn't want to experience systemic racism for the whole of your life and have the effects of that, then mm -hmm. you consider what you can do to be a part of that change to make things more equitable. Mm -hmm. And it's a human experience. And at the root of racism, racism is saying that black people, they were, to, for us to be put in chattel slavery, we were not cat categorized as human. Mm -hmm. We are living with the legacy of that today. We mm. are still not seen as human. Black mm. women are dying in health in in in, in healthcare settings because mm. they're not seen as real women, as mm. feeling pain. Our mm. sons in schools are seen as a threat because they're seen mm. as adults and not children. Mm. It's that human experience that we are denied, and mm. that's what leaders need to be presented with. Would mm. you? have that experience if the answer is no then what are you going to do to change it without yeah. me educating without you without me educating mm. you without me signposting you to a book without mm. me reading anything to you what are you going to do to change mm. yeah i love that and it, it's interesting because both what you've been touching on tasha and, and kamiji what you've been t touching on as well with regards to you know, it's not necessarily our responsibility or our black educators responsibility to be the ones to make the change. Um, it's reminding me of a concept called weaponized incompetence. And it's something I actually learned from a client of mine, um, um, a counseling client of mine um, who introduced this concept to me. But it's basically about um, an individual feigning or, or being deliberately incompetent, feigning incompetence to avoid unwanted responsibility. So if we're saying, you know, when you were touching Kamiji on the fact that, oh, it's just the black teachers that are going to be asked to do something for Black History Month or do something to decolonize the curriculum, like it's, that's not fair. It's not fair. And it's, it's actually, you are now using power again. You're using mm. power and misusing power again for your benefit to avoid responsibility. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Irene, I had an, uh, a question. Um, you, uh, we were talking about Greek uh, mythology and African mythology. And this is something that just kind of came to mind, especially because you are educating within a Christian um, context, within a faith-based context. Um, I don't know if there is maybe a racial component to that as well, where African mythology is often connected with witchcraft and therefore we're not going to learn about that. Whereas Greek mythology somehow just seems more, I don't know, clinical, less... Sub, I don't know. It's subject. I don't know if that's the right term. Subjective. Like, what are your thoughts on that, Erin? Yeah, I think I think it looks more 
more clinical, as you say. It looks more scientific, more organized, you know, mm. more, um, it, it makes sense. Um, but actually, mythology is mythology. Um, mm. And, uh, you know, when you look at some of the Greek or the uh, Latin mytholo mythology, well, let's go with the Greek one because it's more ancient. Um, some of the, the things that we take for granted, like, you know, so, so many of the names that we use consistently are based on uh, uh, the, you know, different gods and everything like uh, uh, the days of the week, the uh, different planets, the like so many things are just related directly with Greek or Latin mythology. Mm. And we take it for granted, we don't question it. Mm. Uh, but actually, I don't, I think that the idea that uh, the the black mythologies, the African mythologies are more demonic than the Greek ones because no one even asks that question. It's just another way to exert power and another way to just distantiate yourself from uh, an African experience. And just like, and it goes again with the, the idea that God is white, that Adam and Eve were white, that mm. Christianity is about whiteness. And there's a lot of language in the Bible that could make you think that, but actually no one describes angels. It's just the light out of angels that looks white. It's not the angel itself. No one describes the color of the skin of Jesus. No one describes the color of the skin of Adam and Eve. No one knows. And if we look at where uh, the Garden of Eden was based, and you know, in uh, we may believe it or not, but the likelihood of Adam and Eve being blonde and with blue eyes is so limited that I don't even know why people still stand on that one. But there's that belief that mm. makes the canon. And then from that canon, then everything else is just determined. So mm. it's okay to be uh, to tolerate Greek or Latin mythology because you know, it's all white people. Uh, mm. But actually, uh, African mythology is bad because you know those people are not really people, so their mythology is not real. Uh, mm. But actually, for me, the, the idea is just let's bring all those things back to the same plate. Mythology is mythology. Mm. That's it. Nothing mm. more. But mythology defines culture. So if you mm. want to understand a culture, you need to understand the mythology. Mm simple as that and being exposed to those things like there are uh, uh, creatures that you know are legendary in African mythologies that are just fascinating and when you discover about them you're just thinking oh my goodness it's not better or worse than Medusa for example or Mars or you know all, all those people like if you look at the chins or the blue genies or all those things they're just fascinating and um. they should have the same space in our uh, uh, mindset, a cultural mindset, as actually has Greek mythology. I absolutely mm. don't regret learning about Greek mythology, but I would love it. I would have loved it if I had learned about other mythologies at the same time. Yeah, I hear that. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Okay, so I guess this is a big question, um, and I'll kind of throw it out to to all of you, and that's um, where do we start with decolonizing? curriculum I think this is the, one of the hardest questions because mm. number one every learning environment is different so you'll start mm. somewhere different essentially but I really do believe that um we're never going to get anywhere we're going to keep chasing our tails if we start with the curriculum mm. Decolonizing the curriculum isn't about taking bits out and putting bits in. It's about addressing the why and then addressing accountability and saying, who, who's going to be accountable for this? Is everyone in this, in this system? So we're talking about, we're going through to head teachers, we're going through to leaders of academies, we're going through to um, sponsors, we're going through to governors, we're going through to the people behind things. And we're saying, are we, are we all on board? Because in the end, budgets are what determine things as well. You can bring in the black curriculum, literally the black curriculum, the company, and, you know, just have them fun stuff. But for how long? Yeah. You know, yeah. for how long? So if we're talking about the system, if we're talking about the structure, 
then it's going to be a long old journey and then we finally come to the curriculum mm. and then we have resource upon resource and we have people trained to actually deliver the resources mm. and we have something that looks very different because it's the manifestation of internal change mm. so I think mm. it would be a long old journey and a lot of people wouldn't see the change for a while in order to really change the way we do things mm. so definitely not with the curriculum is my first first thing <laughs> Mm. yeah thank you wow that's that's a really good point anyone Tasha or, or Irene do you want to add to that yes um I think that uh, decolonizing the curriculum is really teaching content in a truthful way you know mm. there would be no growth in uh, Bristol Liverpool London those cities without mm. um, slavery. Capitalism mm. in Britain was built on the backs of enslaved people. Mm -hmm. But that, that's, the, that's the truth of Britishness mm -hmm. and that is what has been erased. So mm. I actually don't think it's additional work. I mm. think it is reframing what how things are being taught and teaching with honesty and that is um i don't think that that is the resistance because that's the polar opposite to what's going to maintain structural racism and that's the resistance that we face because mm. it's an awful history of, co of colonialism mm -hmm. across the whole commonwealth now, how can Britain reconcile itself with that, the honesty of that, and yeah. teach it in its schools and yeah. position itself in that way and yeah. talk about the after effects of that? You know, yeah. as, as a Caribbean woman of the diaspora, I can trace my family back to enslavement through four or five generations. Wow. That's, that's not that far. Mm. It's not that far. Mm. So we have to recognise mm. that it is about teaching truth. Mm. What is teaching truth is really stripping at the fabric of what this society is, is built on and will challenge so many institutions mm. at the core that I, I don't think it's a battle that this country wants to take on. Um, yeah. Can I, um, ask, can I ask Natasha a question, please? Of course, of course. I think you're exactly right. Do you know of a space? Because I think in the day to day, I think in what does teaching look like? What does educating look like? Because we can see the calendars for the year set out two, three years in advance. They have them up on the online for every county. It's the way that they think. It's all planned. So where in their plan? How do we do that? Do is is there a space? Because I know inset days are days when they welcome new information but do we need to actually slightly change the structure of the school year or the hours dedicated for children and teachers or the educators and the students so that there is space and time to address this with those who will need to impart that truth who are those who will impart that truth and where and when does that happen in the school year because it just runs from year to year to year mm. you know I agree with you. I think that it is about um, your pedagogical practice and how you frame discussions in the classroom. So I'm a religious studies teacher. I will teach about, from Christianity, I will talk about the creation story. 80% of the kids in the classroom will be like, well, I don't believe in God, so I don't agree with the creation story. So I'll say, okay then, so if you don't agree with the creation story, let's look at scientific explanations. And if we chase the human gene pool right back to the first woman, mitochondrial Eve, do you know where they found her? And they'd be like, no, she's African. It's as subtle as that. <laughs> that that's a conversation. That doesn't need to um, have a separate lesson. That's mm. about how you frame the discussions in mm. your classroom, yes? Mm. So whatever 
content you're sharing, mm. there's a voice, a diverse voice mm. that is absent and it's having the intention to say, mm. I'm not comfortable teaching a curriculum that has hidden voices. Mm. I'm going to intentionally create space in my discussions, my classroom discussions, to highlight marginalized voices and give them power and credibility. And I don't actually think that takes a lot of work. It takes mental work in terms of your commitment and your intention. Mm. I think that's useful. And I think that means that we need a lot more people like you in education. Mm. We don't have them and education is happening right now. And that's why, that's why I said that it's so disheartening to know that none of us sitting here in the classroom and mm. that there is, this is common. I, mm. I know peers in Leicester that there's an exodus of black teachers leaving mm. the profession right now because mm. racism is just so we weary, weathering. The mm. effect of fighting race, racism is so traumatic that you have to get to a point, as um, you said earlier, that you have to safeguard yourself but you're safeguarding yourself against a system that is rigged against you that mm -hmm. needs to change. And with all the goodwill and with all the supporters that you have in your family, yes, that's great. But at the end of the day, like you said, Kamiji, we will all face the weight of racism mm -hmm. and we will all have to navigate racial trauma. And mm -hmm. that should be on us. That means that the system is mm -hmm. not right. And not only mm -hmm. that, you know what the worst thing is? As a black woman, our life expectancy is not as long as a white woman. Mm. That's not acceptable. Mm. That's, mm. That's, the, that's the outcome of racial trauma. Mm. And, and that's about our earning capacity, the, mm. the, the things that we can do to buffer our stress. Mm. Um, all It's just not acceptable. And then when we go into the healthcare system, our, our, we're not believed and we're not treated mm. All of this is an outcome of racism. And I just feel, feel like there needs to be honest conversations with um, our educational providers at mm. all levels to, mm. to say, how can you be comfortable with teams that are not diverse in mm. 2023? Mm. I'm sorry, I've been speaking a lot. lot. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm feeling what you're saying, and it's so true. And I knew that this conversation would have these comments. Mm. Also, it's so important to have them again because it's still mm. happening. But in addition to that, I just want to say, literally, anyone who is watching this, anyone who ever watches this, I genuinely feel like all the answers do lie in these conversations but there is someone else who's needed. And it is that white counterpart, I'm sorry to say, mm. but if you are a leader who's scared and who's like, I don't know how to do this, hands off. We did our assembly, <laughs> we ticked our, our box. Like, I don't want to be a box ticker, but I don't have time for anything else because of my mental health, my family, my bills, mm. my, you know, well-being. I get it. Mm. But if you are there listening, genuinely, there are answers. Like, corporate have completely embraced it. They've taken mm. some time. They've decided, okay, we clearly cannot go any further without investing in training that will literally, hopefully transform things. Some, some companies are doing tick box. Some companies are doing literal transformation, cultural transformation. Mm. And education system is not special. They can do the same thing. They may mm. not have the same budget, but some companies have less budget and are doing it too. Some companies are doing mm. it internally. And what you can do if you are an educational leader who literally knows you have keys to change, but you don't know how to change it, contact Vanetta, contact Natasha, contact Irene, contact me, contact any one of us and start the conversation because mm. we deal with leaders. Mm. And we're happy to have a conversation to mm. integrate that process i'm not saying mm. instigate change we're not going to walk up and blow up your you know your your currently very well oiled academy or school no it's going to look like what is on your heart why do you need help and how can we mm. journey with you 
And honestly, that can look so different from company to company to school to school. And it, there's no pressure for it to look a certain way. You don't need to be scared. Mm. There is an opportunity for change and it starts with you, whoever mm. you are. I'm mm. just there because we can sit and converse and converse and you can learn from it from a distance. Go, oh, now maybe I can implement something one day or, oh, that's on my heart. I'll tell someone in the staff room that I listen to this or they should mm. watch it. But in the end, it's just about people relating, conversing, planning, and moving forward. Mm. Mm. Might be a conversation today, which is implemented in two years' time. But mm. let's do something. Mm. Thank that's you. Something. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think I totally agree with like the two components, as in conversations need to happen in the classroom and in the mindset, that, like there needs to be a mindset shift as teachers is how we approach the conversation but also mm. that change will not happen if nothing is happening at the top i would mm. just like to add like a third component that has proven particularly efficient over the years is the parents yeah. Yeah. Parents are actually the best allies that we can have so mm. parents who start the conversations at home who starts um like you know consistently exposing your children to things that are slightly different to thinking differently to thinking like with the beauty of blackness in mind rather than yeah. the isolation of the hiddenness about it reading yeah. books uh, that are written by black authors as well yeah. as written by others but just making sure that even the resources that we bring at home are different um, and diverse already, but also parents are the best way to change anything in any school environment. Mm. Yes. When parents agree on something, things shift really quickly. Mm. If parents decide to not send their kids to that school, that school eventually will not get funding and that school will eventually close. And executives will hear that. So people will respond to external pressure in surprising ways. And the system can also be changed by that. So I think it's a, a tar like a, a corporate target targeted action that we need to have. But actually, there's stuff that needs to happen at the top, stuff that needs to happen in the classrooms. But also, parents we have that have a responsibility. Yeah. Wow. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that, Erin. And that I feel like that beautifully goes into a final segment because I'm mindful of time. A final segment, um, which is about you know educating black children and black communities. You know, going from okay, there are pockets where maybe a decolonized curriculum is being introduced into into schools, but there's also many many schools where that's not happening and where that's far from happening. How do we look at ourselves? What can we do? Because we've we've realized, you know, all three of you have mentioned it in some way or another. We've all been educated with a white bias in mind, you know. Um, we've all had had the experience where we've, we have been taught a colonized curriculum. So when we're looking at, okay, our communities, our children, where, where do we start with educating, um, with educating in that part? So one of the questions um, that I had, my question is for, for you, all three of you, as mothers, as godmothers, as aunties, like, what advice would you give to parents or families to decolonize the education of their black children or the black communities that they're in? I'm happy to start. Yeah, I'm, sure. I, I'm an admirer of uh, the philosophies and teachings of Marcus Garvey, mm -hmm. right? And that might sound quite radical because Marcus Garvey believed that as a black community, we need to unite. Mm -hmm. We need to have a sense of black pride. We need mm -hmm. to uh, center Africa in um, our teachings of our children and our communities. And I think that that is what is a missing link. Mm -hmm. And I believe that assimilation mm -hmm. is not the way. Mm. We can't be working to fit into a system that that pats us on the back for act code switching, but then mm. pushes you away and says that you you rejected. 
we mm. need to recognize that there is so much beauty in blackness mm. when we start making members of our community proud to be black and mm. seeing and demystifying the stigmatization of black knowledge like Irene mm. was talking about African mythology that's this, this stigmatization that is attached to mm -hmm. African knowledge that we really need to challenge and you know Bob Marley says emancipate yourself from mental slavery mm. we need to do that we need to do that work first we need mm. to consciously raise mm. our children with that sense of black pride and mm. then when we have that then we can enter into spaces and not be conformed to them but mm. transform them and say that we are entitled to be seen as credible. So there mm. is a lot of work to be done to challenge mm. that white bias conditioning, to strip mm. away, to rebuild, to re-educate. And mm. I don't think that that's, some people think that's a supplementary school. I think the supplementary school has its place, but I mm. think that what is being critical to the black community is the church. And mm. the church has a massive role in this. Mm. In talking about um, what it means to be black in our society. And also recognizing how Christianity today is not attractive to lots of members of our community because mm. of the legacy of enslavement. We need to have those honest conversations in mm. our spaces. We need to own them and we need to rebuild. Hmm. Thank you, Tasha. That's powerful. That's powerful. Um, yeah, Irene, Kamiji, do you want to add? Yeah, there's, there's, I 100% there's agree, we need to reappropriate the beauty of our heritage. Um, hmm. and, and it starts with like small things, you know, understanding your hair. Um, and how your hair works and that it's actually all different, but that mm -hmm. the beauty of it all. Uh, I'm, I'm just thinking of an example. I have a friend whose two daughters uh, do ballet and um, the ballet teacher was, you know, making all these requests about how the hair of the girls needed to be like in a certain type of bun and everything. And my friend had to just, Sit down with the teacher and be hey you've got two little black girls in your school their hair is not going to do that and mm -hmm. uh, this is what we can do like let's look at it together and see what would still fit with your expectation as a teacher but that is manageable for my child and mm -hmm. uh, that is something that can go with like her hairstyle and everything and they found a way the teacher mm. was humble enough to say something along the lines of like, actually, I think she sent even a letter to all the parents saying she acknowledges that not every girl has the same type of hair. And so these are the options that they have. Mm. Um, the teacher was just willing to have that conversation. My friend was willing to have that conversation mm. rather than, you know, hiding in it. I remember when I did ballet, my mom was contorting, contorting my hair in all kinds of shape to make it mm. fit because there wasn't space to even have that conversation. Mm -hmm. So we, we, we have to relearn, to learn to just embrace ourselves and also kind of advocate for the children around us. Like, you know, I see my niece and uh, when I hope that she wants to do ballet and when that happens, I will have to have a conversation or her mom will have to have a conversation with a ballet teacher because her hair is not going to do what people expect her hair to do. But she's mm -hmm. still valid answer if she wants to be so there's mm. all the things of uh, helping and even us as adults re-understanding like you know black mythologies and understanding how it impacts some of mm. our ancestral thoughts in a way like you know how it impacts our education and our culture and just reappropriating that so that actually we're empowered when we go and advocate i think reading books, reading stories. I remember um, my mom singing lullabies to me that were from her African country, from mm. her country of origin. And then one day in school, my baby brother was taught the same by some, uh, you know, white teacher. And he was so proud to be able to actually translate the lullaby. And mm. it's 
those little things of just being just yeah reclaiming pride and mm. then um, coming back again to you know the christian experience we are taught that pride is a bad thing it's only mm. a, a bad thing in certain contexts i find um, and it's perfectly tolerated in others which mm. drives me but actually there's something about just embracing how you were created because mm. it's good to so just mm. embrace were created and i think starting from that then it's easier to just raise proud black communities that can raise proud children, black children. Mm. wow thank you ren thank you for sharing that that's powerful yeah i guess um well firstly i was just thinking oh my gosh that was beautiful from both natasha mm. and ren i was just soaking it all up listening and just recognizing all the instances where I relate to those examples, like the ballet, I had my own ballet experience with skin colored tights that had to be worn for, you know, mm -hmm. you must be wearing the skin colored tights. All of a sudden I was like, oh, well, <laughs> this is gonna be a problem because I know what you mean by skin colored tights. But anyway, um, the one thing that kind of really came to my heart when I thought about what can I add is, um, talking as black communities as black people i think talking is a journey we've been on um through ge from generation to generation there's a little bit more liberation there's a little bit more you know desire or maybe not desire because everyone's desire might have been as strong as each generation but there's a bit more liberty to talk you know and I remember wanting, growing up as a young girl, wanting to have certain conversations with my parents that I knew my friends were having with their parents, but I just mm. didn't see the space to have that. And then sometimes I'd edge and push towards it and there would be an answer that was kind of like a, like as in, no, that's not a conversation that's happening. Um, and later on in life, I spoke to, you know, some older people in my family about it because I was this person who always loved asking questions. And I said, like, why can't we talk about this? And an answer that I got from one of my family members, which I was really, really grateful that they decided to share with me. They were so uncomfortable sharing it, but they actually came to me after this conversation. They had shut the conversation down. They came to me a couple of days later and said that the reason why I'm not willing to talk about this is simply because I don't know how to. Mm. I with two living rooms. Again, it's that, you know, just a quick aside, two living rooms, yes, not all black people are, you know, having to, <laughs> I'm saying that basically they grew up with two living rooms and it was because one was for the children and one was for the adults, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And the only time the children came to the adults one was when they were guests and it was that you were, you know, paying respects to the guests and saying, hello, auntie, hello, uncle. And then you move into your living room. Mm -hmm. So I all of a sudden was like, whoa, reality check. Me with my entitled, tell me this, tell me that, like share with me your experiences. Like I want insight, I want intimacy. And mm -hmm. they, you know, had the grace to share with me that really vulnerable thing of I never got that privilege of being able to talk to my parents about this. I just had to muddle through mm -hmm. I just had to do the right thing, whatever that was, and not be too curious. And if I made a mistake by, you know, going that way, then I corrected myself because I knew there was going to be no exception for my mistakes. Mm -hmm. so I suddenly realized, oh, my goodness, talking, being able to talk is a privilege. But it's mm. also one that we can step into, just like Irene, you said, I'm going to do those things that my, you know, white counterparts did or other people, you know, do going to the spa because it's fun, because it because I want to. Let's talk. Let's talk to future generations. Let's talk to one another. Let's be vulnerable and share our experiences of having grown up in education, not to say in my day this, in my day that, but to show that there are some things that are timeless and I'm gonna be here for you. Mm -hmm. and we're gonna walk through this together because then we won't be on the back foot as older aunties, um, mothers, godmothers going, why didn't I know about this? You're about mm -hmm. to be expelled? This mm -hmm. happened? This? Because actually half the time, some of my later experiences as a full-time full teacher that really pushed me towards wanting a break was watching these instances of racism happen. 
and going into the staff room absolutely distraught for a child about to log stuff and then instantaneously seeing members of staff who had been involved or who I didn't know hadn't been involved laughing about those instances or demonizing or criminalizing those students. So there is mm. stuff happening within these walls that literally makes the space not safe for these mm. children who are marginalized. Mm. And if we do not give them the space to talk, if we do not give them the space to be intimate, to be vulnerable with us, mm. know that anything is okay to talk about. And you're not going to shock me because I've probably been there before. Mm. Or if you with me, I'll be with you and I'll be sad with you. And mm. I'll be up to you. And I'll say that was wrong. Mm. And I'll be with you. You know, so it's for me, it's I guess, how do we how do we do this as aunties, grandmothers, um, godmothers? I guess it's starting with relationship. Mm. Making sure that the children know this is not an off, this is not an off the table thing. Mm. A shame you don't need to feel like like I am with you and I know this is gonna school is gonna be an interesting journey. Let's let's talk about everything. Yeah. I think that's so powerful. Thank you for sharing that, sis, because you're right. Like those those two front room mindsets have truly, you know, impacted the way that a lot of our parent generations communicate with us. And it's very much on a need to know factual basis. We're not here to discuss emotions, like okay, you've gone through something that maybe wasn't that great. It's okay. You know, tomorrow's another day. Just keep going kind of thing, rather than actually taking the time to feel the hurt. But also realizing that you said with your family member that some of our family members cannot relate because they've not had those experiences because their whole schooling system wasn't a majority black country. Their whole educational journey wasn't. So, you know, I have conversations with some family members of mine where they're like, huh? And I'm like, huh? How do you not? Like, what, what, why are we not understanding each other? It's because we've got such different experiences. Mm -hmm. Like we've, we've had such different ways of upbringing that for them, you know, certain things that I'm very mindful of now and I'm even more so mindful of raising, raising a black daughter, you know, parents' generation are like, yeah, no, it wasn't that deep at the time. And it's like, yeah, because you had a very different upbringing. You had a very different experience and that's okay. Um, right, okay, we are, I'm, I'm very mindful of, of your time. Um, and so we are coming to the end of our conversation. We do have a, um, a comment here that I wanna read in a moment, but just as we're on the topic of kind of, you know, advice that we can give, um, <clears throat> it's also looking at, are there any resources that you can recommend for families to, um, and parents to, um, get themselves into, um, to, to start having those conversations about decolonizing? I, yeah, there are, there, are lots of, um, there are lots of books for children. I find that books for children are a really good way to start the conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, it's part of story time and it's part of something that you can, um, Visualized a little bit and then it opens conversation. So there are quite a number of books um, and resources for children that I find are really, really helpful. There's uh, cartoons that have been, so I, I do not have a, a, a TV, so everything comes to me by Netflix or, you know, um, a Prime, but actually you find really good cartoons uh, that have. Uh, black uh, heroes or heroines and it's just worth starting simple um, I okay. would say and then for parents to you know educate themselves there's again like a plethora of uh, wonderful books just sharing the experience of others and and it's about just finding I was thinking of uh, one that came to mind that was called uh, Don't Touch My Hair um, that when I read it I was just there was so much that resonated with my personal experience and actually just finding the words in someone else's words um, mm. is able to start a conversation because for a lot of us, uh, a lot of my friends would feel very ill-equipped because uh, they didn't study the, the topic specifically. Like it took work for us to get to this mm. point where mm -hmm. we're comfortable to have those conversations. It took mm -hmm. study took time um, and I have lots of friends who don't have the time or don't feel equipped for it but actually finding the words of someone else is actually really helpful so mm -hmm. yeah thank you thanks for sharing your 
Um, okay. Um, going into um, a question for the Q and A as such. Um, with Black History Month around the corner, what would you as educators wish schools would implement in their mandatory curriculum about Black history? And I know we've kind of spoken about that often being used as the token month to just shove stuff in. <laughs> but is there anything that you would say or reflect back on um, in your formal uh, or mainstream education days where you're like, actually, I really wish teach um, schools will implement something particular in that? during that time. I'm not sure if Tasha's frozen yeah. again, so Kamiji. Oh, okay. I, I would just say there needs to be as much a map of the heroes, of the positive, you know, world changes mm -hmm. and UK changes mm -hmm. in each industry. So essentially mm -hmm. the seven mountains, every single mountain needs to be covered when mm -hmm. it comes to black role models, but also mm -hmm. just like, just, just journey. It needs to be journey, not just random icons, you know, just saying different things. It needs to be, okay, we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for this. This changed history. These people changed history. This time changed history. And also contemporary, contemporary role models in the now, who are currently changing, changing things um, mm -hmm. and just representatives from each industry. And, and when it comes, one thing I would also say is work experience is a brilliant opportunity. When it comes to work experience, schools really, really fail. They give it to the children to just go off. But what schools should be doing is stewarding those, you know, forming connections with industries so mm -hmm. that black people don't just end up, black children don't just end up if their parents are first generation immigrants Mm -hmm. And let's just say maybe they don't necessarily have the connections, the professional connections that mm -hmm. a lot of white, white counterparts might. And that's not the case for all black um, uh, black students when it comes to their parents. But there needs to be a sense of equality from them. And mm -hmm. I would say that history month, if you can have speakers come in, if you can have people who are connected to industry, who can create those relationships mm -hmm. with those young people so that they have that route out. Um, that would be great. Just real practical opportunities, basically, not just mm -hmm. picking boxes. Yeah, I love that. It's not just, it is like the history is really important, but it's also looking at how does that impact on the present day so that you're yeah. saying with regards to the practical things. Thank you, Kamiji. Um, Tasha was just asking, um, and if you have any insight on, you know, is there anything that you would wish for schools to implement with regards to black history, seeing that that is coming up soon? Oh, I'm not sure if she's frozen again. She might have. She might have. Okay. Um, in that case, uh, Irene, is there anything that you would advise families to explore um, to help them explore Black History together, Black History Month together? Make Black History Month every month. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Just make it part of like natural life you know just go out of your way to get um uh experiences that just connect your children to um and connect yourself to you know the uh, black history in general uh, mm -hmm. there's a wonderful exhibition at the I'm, i live in the london area so i'm aware of that but i know that there's a wonderful exhibition at the tate modern at the moment uh, about african photographers just go mm -hmm. see that you know when steve mcqueen is exhibiting just take your children to steve mcqueen alvin ailey was there um alvin ailey company was there for two weeks take your kids to see alvin, alvin ailey like expose mm -hmm. them to things that are not um uh, that are just part of the the celebrating blackness but not just during october just make every month black history month and i would say mm -hmm. for schools actually just like you know how about we look at if, if you're a maths teacher there are great mathematicians that have changed the world that are black um mm -hmm. If you're a historian, it's even easier because, you know, but if, if you're a biologist, there are biologists that are black. Like, there are ways to just introduce that in your curriculum mm. in different ways that are not as on the nose as Black History Month. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Um, 
Tasha, I'm not sure if you can hear me, if the connection is interrupted. Yeah, I think it might be. Okay, that going on to, to comments then, um, and I'm not sure if, Iren, this is one for, for you working within a church context primarily. And there's a comment here, um, actually I can show that on the screen, and by Amy that says, how do we deal with the fact that the church is under attack for many reasons? Well, that is a, that's a tough question. That's a tough question, that's a tough question. Um, yeah. I, I think for me, it's about coming back to the fact that, yes, the church is a corporate entity, but my relationship with God is personal. Um, mm. And yes, the church is under attack for many valid reasons. The church is mm. guilty of a lot of crimes, um, mm. let's be honest, and uh, some historical crimes, some crimes that we're still paying the consequences for, um, some crimes that are still being discovered, but actually, Church is only one part of the expression of faith. So for me, it's mm. that uh, reality of the personal expression. But also, I would say, um, actively embracing change within mm. that environment. So if you have a faith um, and you're part of a church community, also, um, you know, starting having the decolonizing conversations, it is fascinating, extremely painful. I'm not going to lie. Um, mm but extremely necessary as well, so. Mm. Thank you, thank you for sharing that, Irene. Okay, we're coming to the end, ladies. And um, thank you so much for your time and you know for, for um, running over a little bit with, with regards to time. Are there any other things that you wanna share, anything else that you wanna say with regards to everything we've explored tonight, really? Um, I know, Tasha, we lost you a little bit at the end because of um, connection issues, but if there's anything that you wanna share or community or Iran, feel free to kind of um, let me know. I think my final question, which I think we might have touched on to a certain extent, but it's just with regards to how would you mentor an aspiring black educator? What advice would you give them? Is there anything that you, you know, would wanna share with regards to that? Yes. <laughs> yes, it would be. Oh, firstly, that's just amazing, gorgeous. I love the idea of mentoring mm. a black, you know, educator. First thing would be for them to create a safe space for themselves mm -hmm. that they associate with their career as a teacher, but isn't in the school space, in which they're able to focus on who they are. Mm. Figure out who you are before you figure out what you do. Because mm. everything can be so overwhelming. It can take over every part of your mind. You go home thinking about those safeguarding things. You go home thinking about, like, you go to everywhere you go, you associate with a resource or whatever, whatever. Like, you're constantly thinking about teaching. But think mm. about who you are and why you're there as a person and mm. allow yourself to have a career growth journey which is relevant to you mm -hmm. so that you can filter the noise from your purpose mm -hmm. and enjoy seeing yourself grow because the joy and the enjoyment is something that can very quickly get lost in education because there's mm -hmm. so many things so that you can go I know that I'm giving an automated reply for you I'm giving an automated reply for you this is a student problem, but just because it's a student problem and I'm a teacher, it doesn't mean that it's not a you problem. So I'm making mm. you, child, accountable for that. And mm. when you don't come back to me with it, I'm not going to let the boundaries get messy and grey. I am going to give you that detention. Mm. And I am going to be parents. And I'm going to do it in love. And I'm going to bless you. And I'm going to make sure that I speak over you, that you are a wonderful person, but that you've mm. done a not so great thing. But I'm mm. separating so that you can enjoy your journey as a human mm. who's chosen teaching, not as teaching mm. like engulfed you. Mm. And then I think the last thing is to clearly map out your career progression because teaching is never going to do that for you. You could stay in the mm. same role forever, the same salary, or just go up in tiny increments. But educated, educators should have a good career, just like everyone else it's a lot harder to move and to see yourself grow. But if you map out your career journey, you can say, you can sense the season better and go, 
actually, I think I've done everything I need to do in this school and I'm going to mm. grow back to myself. It's not just about staying there for the kids and for the kids' brothers and sisters and grandkids. Go mm. to the next place. Grow. Mm. Grow. This is mm. for you. You chose it because you wanted to teach. So, mm -hmm. yeah, plan your journey so you can stay true to that, have integrity, and hold yourself accountable when you start to feel like your, your light is fading. Yeah. Mm. Thank you, Kamiji. Thank you. Um, Tasha or Uren, anyone want to add to any, any of you want to add anything? What, how would you mentor an aspiring black educator? Um, I thought uh, Natasha was there, but I think she's, she's oh, yeah. Tasha, you go. Oh, what was the question? This internet is the worst. So <laughs> it's okay, that's okay. We're just talking about how would you mentor a black an aspiring black educator? Is there any advice that you would give? Okay, so I currently do mentor black educators and I see, I, I see my my principal role as to be an advocate because when you're new is it just me or is it we can't hear her? No, yeah. Tasha, we can't hear you. Such a cliffhanger. I know. I, I, know. I just want to know more. I know, yeah. me too. I'm like, oh my gosh, you are a, you are a mentor. A mentor. Black <laughs> educators. I'm just what going to go in the meantime. Um, yes, I, exactly. I would say, um, my advice would be find people that you can trust and you can have the conversations with. Find the um, allies, black or white, um, and have those conversations and create those safe spaces and definitely hang in there. Mm. Yeah. Thank you, Iren. Thanks for sharing. Tasha, Iren shared in the meantime, you left us on a cliffhanger. So you were, if it breaks down again, I would say, um, I would recommend if you can put it in the comments, there should be an, um, a, an option for you to add it in the comments. But we want to hear what were you saying with regards to you mentor, you mentor people and your primary role is to advocate. I think she's frozen again. No! This means we have to have more of a conversation one time. <laughs> there we go, Tasha. There we go. Oh, I, don't think, I don't know if it's going to stabilize. Anyway, as I was saying that I believe my role is as, as advocate. I, mm -hmm. I use my experience to show the student, the early career teacher, that these are not new and unique experiences. Systemic mm -hmm. racism means that we would have trod, lots of people have trod this path before them. So I mm -hmm. use my experience to support them. Mm -hmm. Just yeah. got that golden nugget. Yeah, you were saying you use your experience to support them. And was there anything else? No, it's fun again. I totally agree. Um, I would also, in uh, if there are some people listening that are that have a bit more experience in education, even if you're out of the system, um, there's so much wealth of experience that you can share to support one another and to support. Mm -hmm educators so to so embrace it like don't feel like because you're out of the system you're irrelevant mm. because your experience is valid the whatever you went through as an educator is valid and will help a younger educator so um mm. i think it's not just on the younger educators to connect but also uh, some of us that have more experience that have chosen to be out of the system for however long actually our experiences are still extremely valid yeah, really appreciate that, Irene. Thank you for sharing that. And and also highlighting that, you know, just because you've left that particular context of education doesn't mean that you're an imposter and can't provide value. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, we have truly come to the end of our conversation. It's been absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much, ladies, for your time, for your insight. There's just so much for me to kind of just go and digest and just think about how 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 do I parent well? You know, how do I parent um, with the wisdom that you have shared as well um, with regards to education? How do I approach that as a mom now? Um, but also, you know, as an auntie, as you know, as a godmother, how how can I support my community in um, 
and, and particularly the, the black children within my community to, to feel empowered, to feel seen, to feel celebrated um, and not to, to feel put down or, or limited in some way. So thank you so, so much for your time tonight, ladies. I know Tasha's um, having issues with internet, which is, um, yeah, why she's, she's not here at this end bit. But I just wanted to, to give people the opportunity to, to get in touch with you. Um, thank you so much for being here and for your time. Um, so with Natasha, you can find her on Natasha Boyce on LinkedIn or natashaboyce.nb at gmail.com. Kimiji, you can find her on IG at cole.consults or email her at miji at coleconsults.com. Just a quick one, sorry, it's .co for me, for my email address. Oh, I'm so sorry. Oh, okay. good day, sorry at all. .com often is a, is a common one because um, so, not many people are used to .co, but yes. Yeah, coleconsults.co. Um, thank you. Thank you for sharing that, Kimiji. And Irene, find Irene on IG at God Loves Pink 2 on Facebook at Irene Nalandu. And email irene.nalandu at gmail.com. Thank you so, so much for being here, ladies. Um, if anybody obviously has any further questions on imposter syndrome, the book that I've spoken about, you know, feel free to such stay in touch with me. Um, blueprintway.com, Vanetta at blueprintway.com. And you can find me on the many socials that are available. And also um, get a copy of my book, um, Me, Myself, and Imposter, How to Boss Your Imposter Syndrome Through the Fraud Framework. So once again, thank you so much for joining us tonight, ladies. Um, thank you so much for your time as well and for this wonderful, wonderful, enriching conversation. Um, and thank you so much to Tasha as well. Um, yeah, and I look forward to continuing this off camera and what you know whenever uh, the time comes as as aunties honorary uh, as aunties and honorary godmothers and all of that as well. I'm really looking forward to just gleaning more of your wisdom. So thank you for your time, ladies. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much, Vanessa, for having us. It was awesome. Yeah. And thank you to all who, who joined in and for all your comments and questions, whether in advance or um, live tonight. So have a good evening. Take care. Bye.